Ladies and gentlemen, good evening, and thank you for joining us for our seventh Newport Lecture Series presentation of the 2020 to 2021 academic year, What the Great Pacific War Can Teach the U.S. Military Today. I am George Lang, CEO of the Naval War College Foundation, and it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you this evening. I also want to thank Chairman Bilden, our esteemed Board of Trustees, members, friends, and benefactors, as well as my staff for their continued support and commitment for the missions of the Naval War College and Naval War College Foundation. Enabled by our generous uh, foundation members for more than half a century, the college is able to continue its innovative, cutting edge research, teaching and training of civilian and military leaders worldwide. Thank you. Tonight's presentation is only a glimpse of scholarly topics, mid grade and senior level uh, officers, uh, 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 I'm sorry, level officers of our joint force team are immersed in during their 10 month academic experience at the Naval War College. I know you will enjoy it. Before I continue, just a reminder that should a question come to you during the presentation, please submit it via the question and answer box and I'll be happy to present it to our guest speaker during the Q&A session. As many of you know, this is an event that is typically hosted monthly during the academic year at the Naval Station Newport Officers Club, usually preceded by a 30 minute reception where guests can mingle with Naval War College Foundation staff and friends and typically the guest speaker of the evening. But obviously, since COVID took center stage over a year ago now, which is amazing to even say, we've been bringing Newport Lecture Series presentations and many others hosted by the foundation to you virtually. A significant benefit of this approach is the opportunity to interact with many of our members and friends across the nation, not just in the local Newport area. So we appreciate you tuning in from all around the country. Now to introduce and welcome your distinguished speaker uh, this evening. Dr. James Holmes has been with the Naval War College since 2007 and currently serves as a professor in the Strategy and Policy Department and is the inaugural holder of the J.C. Wiley Chair of Maritime Strategy. A former U.S. Navy Surface Warfare Officer, although you're never former in my mind, once a swell, always a swell, he was the last gunnery officer in history to fire a battleship's big guns in anger during the first Gulf War in 1991 while serving aboard USS Wisconsin BB-64. He has published many books, articles, and scholarly essays, including A Brief Guide to Maritime Strategy in 2020 and Red Star Over the Pacific, second edition in 2018, two publications that you will find on the CNO's uh, professional reading program reading list uh, released just yesterday. Dr. Holmes is a graduate of Vanderbilt University, where he earned a BA in mathematics and German. He completed graduate work at Southern <laughs> Virginia University, earning an MA in international relations. Providence College, earning an MA in mathematics, and the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University, where he earned an MA in law and diplomacy and a PhD in international affairs. He is also a graduate of the Naval War College and earned the coveted Naval War College Foundation Top Graduate Award in his graduating class. Ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, please give a warm virtual welcome to Dr. James Holmes. Hey, George, thank you very much. Uh, let me see if I can share my share my content. It looks like we are uh, we are golden. So the topic that uh, George and the foundation have asked me to talk about tonight is, is pretty straightforward. And it's, uh, of course, it's right on the screen in front of you. What can we learn the United States military learn from the Great Pacific War? And I'm not even going to begin to scratch the surface. George, uh, George indicated that we do a lot more in our courses than I'm going to do tonight. This is this hardly even scratches the surface of one of our cases, namely the Pacific War. One way to think about the Pacific War for the United States Navy and Marine Corps in particular, this is our Iliad. I mean, this is where we draw inspiration from. This is where we look for our heroes. I mean, think about Dory Miller at Pearl Harbor or uh, Ernest Evans at uh, Leyte Gulf. I'm not going to get to. I'm not going to get into that into all that inspirational stuff. I mean, there is a reason that people like Ian Toll and James Hornfisher uh, can write uh, hundreds and hundreds of pages of brand new material on the war and still sell it and and, and, ha and have it do very well uh, in in the book rankings. So I'm going to take a very workmanlike approach to it, and I'm going to I'm going to defend a very very banal thesis, namely that we can learn a lot from it. And again, I will not even begin to scratch the surface, but I did try to call out seven big things that I think we ought to think about. As we try to learn the lessons of the Pacific War and put them to work, especially in the Pacific Ocean today, I'm mostly a China, I'm mostly a China guy, so you will see me. You will see me putting what we're trying to learn from the Pacific War to to use in the in the Western Pacific in the competition with China today. So let me turn right to it. The first thing I want the first thing I would commend to you is the idea that strategy rhymes. 
Uh, the great Mark Twain, once a resident of these parts out in Hartford, Connecticut, maintained that history never repeats itself, but it does rhyme. Certain that certain things echo from age to age. So certain things are actually different as well, and these things are also instructive. They help us think and gain insight into uh, the strategic and operational environment that we find around us. What do I what do I mean by this? Well, this was uh, this, this, here, of course. Here, of course, is the leadership in World War II. Admiral Nimitz, Admiral Nimitz, looking at his map, President Roosevelt, probably the probably the most geographically minded president we've ever had. He'd like to he he has, he'd like to tell the American people during his fireside chats, get out your atlases. During his famous uh, his famous fireside uh, address on or fireside chat rather on, on Washington's birthday in 1942, he, he he repeatedly told the American people, look at your map. I'm going to show you what the Axis is doing and why it is important for us to wage war against the Axis in order to survive. Really, the United States was really at risk, even though threats were far away on this on the other side of the Atlantic and on the other side of the Pacific. They could they could pose a very real threat to the United States. So geography, the geography of strategy in particular, is something that rhymes to this day because the physical setting does not really change what we do within that setting uh diplomatically and especially militarily does change and i think that's where the, i think that's where we can put the lessons of the great pacific war to use here's a japanese map but here's a japanese map that i uh, recently attained uh out in town actually out in portsmouth of the just depicting the japanese defense parameter of the pacific as they saw it in 1941 the basic geographic idea that the japanese had with it was that they would enclose a large swath of the pacific ocean and they would make it Japanese. They would also ensconce themselves on the on the on the continent of Asia. They had been in Manchuria since 1940. Keep in mind, Japan has been fighting on the continent of Asia for 10 years before Pearl Harbor. It's ensconced itself in, in Korea and it's invaded uh, continental China as early as 1937. So this is this war is not a new thing for for Japan at the time when the United States comes into it. So that's a, so that so that's sort of the inner defense perimeter. They're, they're talking about enclosing and defending. To a geographic space, mainly maritime space, as you can see, because there's not a lot other than islands within that defense perimeter. Japan, Japan, starting at Pearl Harbor and into the spring of 1942, really expands the geographic space it is trying to enclose and 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 defend against the United States and other and other contenders. Let me let me let me summon out the outer defense perimeter. This is the farthest extent of Japanese conquests in, into into early to mid 1942. And look at that. I mean, this is the biggest body of water on the face of the earth. And yet you have a small island state trying to conquer it, conquer all this, uh, all this maritime space, as well as well as one of the world's largest countries, namely China. And it extended sway into Southeast Asia. Of course, of course, the, the, the southern resource area, as Imperial Japanese Navy strategists called it, and even into the Indian Ocean, striking at the uh, striking into uh, off the southern tip of India and waging war in the China Burma India theater. So these are this is a for a small uh, for a small resource strapped island state, this is a, this is an expedition of monumental import that Japan is trying to do, or that is trying to pull off in the, in the face of the United World. Now, how, how did Japan think about trying to defend that defense program, either the inner one or the more expansive one that they initially under or originally eventually undertook? Well, we would call it access denial. This is the term that the Pentagon uses to describe what China in particular is trying to do in the Pacific today. It's very much it's very much an echo for what from what the for, for what the Japanese were trying to do. Uh, so really started that they really started thinking about this as early as the as early as the presidency of Teddy Roosevelt in 19, by 1907. The Imperial Japanese Navy has declared the United States Navy the, the next strategic the next strategic aim, aim, enemy after having defeated uh, China and first Russia at sea uh, in a couple of wars over the previous two decades. And what they did, they didn't think about uh, creating a, an impermeable, a hard defense perimeter. So it's sort of a sort of a rigid perimeter. What they thought about doing was taking it, seizing Pacific Islands, uh, putting aircraft on them, putting submarines in the waters around them, and basically cut, cut, trying to cut the U.S. Pacific fleet down to size as it steamed westward from Hawaii and from ports on the west on the west coast to to a battle probably in somewhere in the vicinity of the Philippine Islands, which of course was American territory. Uh, in in 1941 and really up until 1946, so they so again they they did not think they were going to keep us out of the region entirely. They did think that they could weaken us on our way so that and cut us down to size so that the Imperial Japanese Navy's uh, surface fleet, its battle fleet, could come out and wage a war for command of the sea uh, from a, from a position of at least parity and perhaps even superiority. 
So this is so, so again, they're trying to throw they're trying to throw up a defensive buffer and essentially and essentially slow us down, absorb, absorb the shock from that from that westward voyage on the part of the U.S. battlefleet coming from Honolulu or coming from Pearl Harbor. This is a again, this is something that we find an echo of in the in the Pacific today. President Xi Jinping and his lieutenants in the People's Liberation Army they, they don't use the term access to now, but they did, but they do quite quite clearly. Uh, have have similar ideas in mind. They want to they want to start hitting it, start hitting the Pacific Fleet as it tries to get into the theater and unify with the Seventh Fleet uh, in in uh, in Japan, along with affiliated joint joint forces as well. Again, very similar logic. Try to weaken us as we come. Try to try while at the same time attacking forces that are already in the region. Prevent prevent the United States from amassing a dominant fleet that can go out and defend Taiwan, defend the Senkaku Islands. Uh, fight in the South China Sea. Pick your favorite battleground that we read about in the news every day. So again, this is a, this is a, this is a very a very clear echo to Imperial Japan. And in fact, uh, because of high technology, uh, China has it much easier than Imperial Japan did. This is a this is a family of missiles that can strike not only at land masses, uh, but also but also at moving ships at sea. If you believe what the Pentagon reports say about China's anti ship ballistic missiles, these are th these are things. That, the world's first anti anti ship ballistic missiles. They can strike far out to sea, hundreds if not thousands of miles out to sea from Chinese territory. So China doesn't need necessarily even need to go to the trouble of seizing uh, seizing forward islands so for, to create bases to strike at our fleets very very far from the from the Asian mainland. Let me let me call out the, the range the outer range of the DF twenty six anti ship ballistic missile, which is estimated at over two thousand nautical miles. That's a long way. If you if you if you think we're in hostile territory, the U.S. Pacific Fleet's in hostile territory, two thousand miles from the, from from the uh, potential battleground, that uh, that gives you some se some sense of what we're up against. And here's a here's how I would trace that out. This this of course comes from the Center for Strategic and International Studies down in Washington D.C. So again, you'll notice you'll notice that 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 arc traces a whole lot of uh, real estate. It which it's far far beyond Japan. It's a, it encompasses all of the South China Sea. It encompasses the Bay of Bengal. It, it even goes into the Arabian Sea. This is a massive swath of geographic space where China can make its military weight felt. So again, so this is this is this is a way to juxtaposing this against what we saw in the in the Pacific War gives you, it gives you it gives you an interesting way to think about what we ought to be doing today. And to just uh, just to just to reiterate this. I tell you, it's 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 strange how it's strange how often this uh, this idea of a perimeter about fifteen hundred nautical miles offshore comes up. You know, you know, the, the the PLA Navy, China China's Navy, has thought for many years about about trying to gain command of the sea within the second island chain, which is indeed about fifteen hundred nautical miles offshore. So if we so if we take so if we take that feature sort of as an outer limit of what China is trying to accomplish. Here's kind of what it looks like, and this is a graphic out of the Red Star over the Pacific book that uh, George kindly mentioned at the outset. This, this gives you a sense of some of the munitions that can, can come raining down on our fleets as they try to approach the Asian seacoast, whether it's from submarines, whether it's from land-based aircraft, land-based missiles, uh, surface surface craft, all armed with uh, with anti-ship with anti missiles of various types. This gives you a sense of the, of the thicket of defenses that China's, China's military has erected to make things tough, very, very tough on the United States and allied fleets uh, trying to defend what they, what they deem worthwhile. And it's a, it's a very difficult problem. It's, 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 and I'm sure we'll talk about this at the Q&A. In fact, I, a couple of years ago, I, I briefed uh, CNO Richardson, Admiral Richardson, on this, on, on my ideas about anti-access. And, I, and I, I got the idea to compare it to the crumple zone in your car. If you think about what, what anti-access is, it, it's trying to create that buffer. The, the, the crumple zone in your car is not a static or a hard and rigid comp component. It, it's designed to control, collapse in a controlled way, rather, upon a collision. Thus, thus absorbing the, the shock from that impact, slowing it down, and thus and thus keeping the collision from getting to the to the place that you're worried about, which is where you're sitting, where you and your family are sitting in the car. If you apply if you apply that idea of a Chinese crumple zone, an offshore crumple zone against U.S. military activities, this is a, this is the graphic I used in that particular article, and it and it actually. I, the, the graphic artist did a great job. Look at, I mean, look at that, look at that, look at that shield crumpling as the United States Pacific Fleet moves into it, and again, either gets slowed down or perhaps, in the ideal case from China's standpoint, perhaps even st even stalled out before it even makes it to, makes it to the battleground. Either way, China gains time. 
trying to, to get across the Taiwan Strait to conquer Taiwan or do whatever the, whatever the leadership in Beijing deems worthwhile. And again, this is a very tough problem, and this is something that we can glimpse from studying the Pacific War. Okay, move on, move on ahead at a little, a little more rapid pace. Second, second big point I would call out for you is that little ships can make big trouble, even, even for even for very powerful bat, bat, or battle fleets. This is a this is a picture of a diesel a diesel submarine from the from the Pacific War. The United States Pacific Fleet gets underway from Pearl Harbor on December seventh, nineteen forty one. Such as such as it could go to sea, the, the order goes out: sink everything that floats a Japanese flag. It doesn't have to be a warship; it can be a tanker, it can be a transport, it can be whatever. And in fact, the, the targets of choice end up being merchantmen because if you think about what Japan, the Japanese Empire, was, it was a dispersed island empire bound together by shipments of material and manpower from place to place. Japan, of course, is a resource is a resource poor nation. It is dependent. On supplies of oil and, and oil and rubber and all sort of commodities like that. If you can, if you can take down the, the transports that that, that that bind that empire together, you can you can really apply a lot of political pressure uh, to to ultimately capitulate to your will. And this is and this is the, the value that the U.S. submarine fleet brought to, brought to an offensive again, starting on December seventh and leading all the way to the end of the war. Just a few statistics. Look at that: 1,100 1, merchantmen go to the bottom. Because of U.S. submarine attacks, a battleship, eight carriers of cruisers and destroyers of various types. The, the Japanese suffered triple the losses they had forecast before the war. They lose 20% of the fleet before they do anything about it. They do not enact convoys until late 1944, when the end game in the war is started to come into view. And to get to, to give you a so to give you a sense of the blind spot that the Japanese bring to this, they do not they do not conduct an offensive. Uh, commerce raiding war of their own. They do they do attack the U.S. Navy from time to time. They do not go after the vulnerable logistic and logistics fleet that makes that helps that Navy wage war across international international intercontinental distances. So I think that so I think that this is this is a concept that little ships can make big trouble that, that, that didn't really ever register with the Imperial Japanese Navy leadership. And I think that perhaps uh, it explains why democratic Japan, our, one of our closest friends in the world today, is so good at submarine warfare. I think they, I think they really took that uh, experience to heart, and actually, and it actually, and it actually resonated with them after the war as they started uh, as they started becoming an American ally and thinking about how to uh, to pursue their aims in the post World War. I think I look at look at this ship. We are we are claiming shipping faster than Japanese shipyards can actually rebuild it. Again, not to, not until late 1944 does the Japanese Navy. Create a create a convoy, an escort command to start convoying shipping, which ended up being the most uh, the most effective tactic to tactic to overcome submarine warfare, as we saw in the Atlantic Ocean, uh, with with ourselves being targeted. So again, it, it really takes a long time for the Japanese to come to terms with what is happening and start trying to counter it. And, and it's way too it's way too late by the time they start to get it right. I mentioned I mentioned the resource imports. Look at this, man. Look at look at look at how coal, iron, and steel and steel. Imports into the Japanese home islands drop off by 1945, almost, almost entirely in part by because of air power and surface raiding, but primarily because of submarine warfare. This is a, this is a death blow for an island empire like Japan. And it's a, and, and small ships again, super empowered small ships with torpedoes and today anti ship missiles of various types, sea mines and th things. These are things that really pack a wallop, even when matched up against a battle fleet. With submarines, obviously, we, we this is I would describe them as the core of Western fleets today, but also surface craft. This is this is the Norwegian uh, skilled st stealthy surface craft. These are, these two are craft that can that can cause great pro great problems to enemy battle fleets if they if they're operating in a near coastal environment. And something that China, something that China has tapped into uh, with its fleet of Type Twenty Two uh, 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 Hobe catamarans, all armed with eight anti ship missiles apiece. This is the kind of thing that uh, we're up against. This is also the kind of thing that we can bring to bear in our own strategy as we try to reshape reshape it to uh, to uphold our interests along along the first island chain and in the China Seas in the Western Pacific. Okay, third point: if a, if a new navy is on the way, it affects how you calculate risk. What do I mean by a new navy? Well, we know that uh, we know that in the 1930s we had a far sighted uh, set of leaders, not only in the uniformed navy but also but also in Congress. Uh, Representative Carl Vinson, who I'll show you in a minute, in, of Georgia, in, in particular, he actually shepherded through a series of naval rearmament acts. 
first building up a field building up to treaty limits as established in Washington and London a couple of decades before, uh, again, incrementally adding up. And then ultimately in 1940, uh, passed by passing something called the Two Ocean Neck Act of 1940. Cumulatively, these acts essentially directed the Navy to build a second complete uh, U.S. Navy so that there's a complete Navy in the Atlantic, a complete late Navy in the Pacific Ocean. And, it, this, and this, of course, provides mass. It, pre, it, pre, it prevents us from having to swing forces back and forth the way we had before that. Before this, it, 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 this, and this really becomes uh, a massive advantage for the United States in the competition with Germany, but, uh, but especially with Japan. But think, think about it in terms of risk. If I have a spare of something, well, if I have a spare of something, then the, whatever's in my hand, I can afford to risk that. Nimitz doesn't have a lot in his hand when after he shows up in late December to take command of the Pacific fleet. He has the battered remnants of the Pearl Harbor fleet, but he knows that this two ocean Navy is being built back home. It will eventually train up and start arriving in the theater. And in fact, and indeed, I usually, I usually date it to the, to the arrival of USS Essex, the class ship of, of one of our, of our newest class of fleet carriers, which shows up in Pearl Harbor, ready to go in May of 1943. And the, the fleet charts start showing up in, in, in increasing numbers in late 1943 into 44. But, that, but, but knowing that that is on the way lets Nimitz gamble with what he has. And we, we see this now, we see this especially clearly in the Battle of, in the battle of Midway in June of 1944. Here's, a, here's Carl Benson, as I said, I would show him. This is, I, I would describe him in the, as the architect of the Two Ocean Navy Act, and I think directly responsible, along with the uniform that Navy uh, sailors, and sailor, sailors and leaders who, who won the Battle of Midway. Here's a, here's a, here, here are uh, Nemesis, Nemesis orders to the fleet to... Uh, Admiral Spruance and Admiral Fletcher, Frank Jack Fletcher, are, they're very simple because of this. He says that you should fight according to the principle of calculated risk. Well, that's like, that's like you know, buy low, sell high type stuff. But he explains, do not do not engage superior enemy forces unless you can do worse to them than they can, than they can do to you. The, the two the, the two uh, commanders heading up the ta carrier task forces at Midway figured out that they that they had a good chance of doing worse to the Japanese Navy. That they could do, that they could do to the U.S. Navy, and it was actually, and that was actually a worthwhile risk because, again, we another Navy was on its way eventually. What I, what became of this uh, of this venture in risk taking? As we know, as we know, the Imperial Japanese Navy in a in a, in a brief encounter, a fairly brief encounter on June fourth, 19, 1942, loses the flower of its carrier air power, the Kido Butai, the mobile carrier striking force, owing to, owing to U.S. Uh, naval aviation striking striking out of that fleet. Not only from our fleet, but also from uh, from uh, airfields on Midway Island. So again, if you got a spare Navy coming, that, that's a really good thing from, from from a standpoint of risk calculation, and something that Nimitz really something that Nimitz really benefited from, as well as the nation did. This is actually, I would say, a negative lesson for us today, though. Do we have an Do we have a new Navy, an entirely an entire spare Navy building in American shipyards today? Well, we know that we have struggled to get to 355 ships. We we made some progress over the last four years. We also know that we have a long, long way to go, and that we certainly are not on the way to doubling the size of the United States Navy anytime soon. If you, if you take if you take the two ocean Navy being a standard, sort of a rough standard for what for where we stand in naval construction. If a new navy is not on its way, that suggests that naval commanders today will be, would have to be much more careful and cautious and prudent in how they use naval assets because there may not be another navy. Uh, there may not be replacements coming along before the war is over. Our adversaries want to fight short wars. They don't want to fight long protracted wars like the Pacific War. And if they can gain, if they can gain time through anti-access, they know they know that the, the large numbers of U.S. reinforcements may not be on on the way in time to make the difference in, in a short war. So we have it. We have that. We have uh, combat combatants like the like the Zumwalt class. We're getting all of three of these things. Wonderful, wonderful ships they look like, but at the same but at the same time, we're not getting much mass. And I think that I think that's sort of where we stand. So, I so again, I would describe this as a negative lesson to take out of the Pacific War experience. We can also learn from our adversaries, and if this, of course, is Admiral Yamamoto, the Supreme Commander of the Imperial Japanese Navy. The, the, J Japan had a had a had a strange. Well, it's not really strange. I mean, it's it was just a, it is what it is. It's a cultural preference for being very deceptive. I mean, if you if you read back into Chinese and Japanese strategic decisions, there's a lot of strategic culture, strategic uh, classics. There is a lot of talk about deception. Sun Tzu talks about it. Mao talks about it. Uh, Miyamoto Masashi, the great, the great Japanese swordsman and philosopher, talks about it. They are always trying to be deceptive. 
and it's sometimes it's, it's sometimes in effect in many cases they it, they get too cute with being deceptive being deceptive is good but you can't take it to excess just like you can take anything to excess they would they would disperse forces all over the all over the map trying to try to make uh, the enemy the united states thinking their forces were weaker than they were but at the same time they would they would spread their forces out so far that they could not mutually support each other when battle happened they couldn't rush to the scene of battle mass and win that's a, and that is something that we have to think about because the the tendency for ourselves is going to be to spread out in the western pacific as, I, as i'll show you as i as i go along here towards the end but uh what do i mean by it being too cute well at Midway, go back to Midway again, there, the Japanese fleet was divided into a number of task forces, including the Kido Butai, which of course took the brunt of the, of the naval aviation action, but the, the main force, the main body of battleships, destroyers, and cruisers was far, was far too far away to actually reach the scene of battle and help make a, di make a difference at Midway. So again, it is very, very dangerous. Yes, try, yes, try, to, be, try to conceal your intentions and your whereabouts and so forth, but at the same time, you do have to you do have to keep the principle of concentration of force in mind. This uh, this of course is is described as the highest and simplest law of strategy by many by many, uh, by many greats in the field, and that's a negative lesson that we can take from Japan. Here's a here's the here's the the, the diagram of uh, the Japanese war plan at Leyte Gulf late in the war. Look at all I mean look at all this. It's it, it's just spaghetti. The Japanese have once again divided their they've divided their forces, and they're they're trying to go through all the various straits to get at the U.S. landing force on on the island of Leyte, of Leyte, and ultimately, and ultimately, it's, it's we we are simply able to defeat them piecemeal using naval air power, land based air power, and of course, and of course, uh, fleets in action. But again, so this so so when you do when you fragment your force too much, you're subjecting each part of the, each fragment of that force to defeat in detail, and this is indeed what befalls the Japanese. The fifth, fifth big point, uh, quite clearly, we need to think in terms of fighting on and around islands. This is uh, General Alex Alexander Vandegrift, who commanded uh, Marines on Guadalcanal during the early, the early phase of that battle, that six-month-long battle in, in the Solomon Islands from late 1942 into 1943. This is something the Marines are always studying today, and the Navy to, and the Navy to a lesser extent, but, but as, as we pursue what we call naval integration, trying to make ourselves into a unified Navy and Marine fleet, this, this, this experience is something that is being revisited all the time to, to, to determine how we can fight on, on islands, how we can get ashore, how we can use sea power and, and uh, land power interchangeably to try to uh, accomplish our strategic goals, not only on land, but at sea and in the airspace above. So Guadalcanal, Guadalcanal becomes is a, is a very key case uh, uh, for for maritime strategists trying to come to grips with this and put this insight to work in the contemporary setting, especially especially in the Western Pacific. If you if you update these conflict, if you refresh and update these ideas, you, you, uh, today you come to, you come to documents like this. The Marines, the Marines are always talking about things like literal operations in a contested environment, expeditionary advanced base operations. United States or the U.S. Navy has, has come up with an idea of, of distributed maritime operations. This is a similar idea about distributing combat power among many more, but smaller, but it's still heavy hitting combatants, so that uh, so that we can so that we can do this near shore combat and hope and hope to d deny our adversaries, China, Russia, whoever the case may be, the use of the sea that they need to to have the use of in order to accomplish their strategic goals. So this is so this so this is this is a way of think of thinking that dates I think in, in in a very real sense back to the Pacific War. When you, if we look at uh, East Asian geography today, this this is what the China the Chinese call the first island chain, reaching all the way if you if you take it to its extreme all the way up to the to the Alaska to the Alaskan Aleutians, but uh, but certainly running down through Japan through Taiwan the Philippines and on around probably and, and, and ending to up depending on who who you ask somewhere around Singapore. Following the following the Indonesian uh, archipelago on on around, you'll notice you'll notice that note that no Chinese seaport outflanks the first island chain, and that the first island chain is entirely in the hands of American friends or allies or partners or all three. This uh, the, this this create this represents a way to combine geography with military power to make things very difficult on Chi on China's PLA as well as on China's uh, merchant fleet if we want to put economic pressure on them. During, time, during times of war, which is obviously something maritime forces excel at. Just, just, to, uh, just to give you a Chinese, a Chinese map looking at this, they are very sensitive to the, to the fact that they have to be able to get through the narrow seas. 
the straits through the, through these islands in order to even get out of the Chinese China seas into the Western Pacific. And they also, again, they understand that the United States and its allies could, if we do things right, use these islands in concert with air, naval, and ground power in order to, in effect, turn this island chain into a metal chain, as Chinese strategists call it, a wall that, that, will, that, that will bind, that will essentially keep uh, Chinese shipping inside the island chain if it's already inside, or keep it from coming back if it's outside the island chain. Either way, it's a way to make, make things here very, very difficult on our adversaries. If you're the United States, Japan, what a pick your pick your favorites ally of the United States in the Western Pacific. These are these are ideas that, that and in fact you can find this on online. It, it, it just appeared in December. They find their the, their way into the currently the currently uh, or recently appeared tri service maritime strategy, which was put out by the Navy, the Marine Corps, and the Coast Guard last December. It, it talks a lot about island warfare. Talks about a lot a lot of these different concepts, whether it's expeditionary, advanced base operations. Uh, uh, distributed maritime operations, all the all the sort of uh, concepts that I told that I've mentioned that are floating around. It's well worth your time. It's a it's a well written document. It's not too long, which I think is a, it's a is of great value in official documents. But it quite clearly it quite clearly harkens back to to the, to the Second World War in the Pacific. Sixth point, I'll just make very quick very quickly before moving on towards the end here. Armies and air forces are sea services too if they are operating in the maritime environment. Here, of course, I should, is, is a wonderful is a wonderful advertisement of General MacArthur, who commanded one of the one of the amphibious offensives in the Pacific, all the way across, all the way from the Solomons onto the Phil Philippine Islands. So that's the, that's the U.S. Army taking charge of amphibious warfare, doing the island hopping thing, doing doing uh, doing what we know that the Army and the Navy and the Marine Corps did together in this in the South Pacific. I think they, and I, I think it's, it's it's actually really nice to see how the other services, the ground based services today. The Army and the Air Force in particular are actually embracing their maritime past. For example, oh, just just a, just a little eye candy of Leyte Gulf. Again, this is this, this is this is where this is where uh, MacArthur's forces land, and again, a lot of them are Army forces. In fact, our soldiers will oftentimes tell you we did more maritime stuff, more amphibious stuff in the Pacific than the Marines did. Of course, the Army is a much bigger service, so that kind of makes sense. But yeah, you get the sense that they are actually proud of this maritime past. And many of them are anxious to recover, to recover that, to the extent that they are talking about ideas like multi multi domain operations, multi domain meaning land, but also but also sea, air, uh, cyberspace, earth orbit, whatever 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 uh, whatever domain you want to pick. This is where the United States Army is thinking about operating, to where it, to, to the extent that it's talking about uh, obtaining long long range artillery to operate on islands, whether it's actually whether it's rocket artillery, whether it's missiles, whether it's uh, long range guns, and so forth. But quite clearly, the army sees that it has a maritime future, and it is looking at its maritime past to try to get ready. And, and in a similar vein, you see Air Force bombers doing things like firing long long range anti ship missiles. This is a brand new missile that that can strike at enemy shipping at long range. Or old B fifty two is finding finding new life, dropping precision sea mines creating uh, minefields potentially along that island chain to again help make things tough on an adversary that's trying to egress from that uh, from home waters into the western pacific so again we are, so we are seeing a joint concept of sea power coming coming together and i think and i think it's and i think it's a beautiful thing but to behold and i hope it i hope it continues i think it will last uh, last idea and i'm just going to skip right through this because but i do want to make it i do want to put in a word for the mundane stuff it's, it's 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 fun to obsess over uh, you know air, aircraft carriers and uh, the destroyers, all the things that we associate with sea power. But without without logistical support, with a lot of without a lot of mundane functions, those things don't accomplish a whole lot. And here, here of course, we see a beautiful battleship out uh, refuel, refueling in the Pacific during the Pacific War. We, I mean, as uh, George told you, I'm an old gunnery officer, so this uh, this to me is the face of naval warfare. But at the same time. To, to use a, to use another uh, propaganda poster, man, the, the Navy had to recruit carpenters, machinists, electri electricians, technicians of all sorts in order to build the suit two ocean Navy, build it to, to build the bases to support it in forward operating zones. The, all of the all of these functions are things without which no battle fleet can succeed. And just just for example, here's another unwrap. Here's another unwrap uh, photo. Look on a pretty rough day. It looks like. Of course, ships move in a, a, within 200 feet of each other, crews on parallel courses, 
rig hoses, rig, rig wire transfer, wire transfer lines between them, and transfer fuel and cargo. This is, and, and thus allows the fleet to stay at sea rather than putting into port. And that gives the that gives the fleet the fleet not only extended range, but also the ability also the ability to fight all the time rather again rather than again putting into port and interrupting interrupting the battle function. So something something that really allowed us to go those intercontinental distances in the Pacific. Salvage salvage crews. I mean, this, here, here we see USS Oklahoma being salvaged after being sunk at Pearl Harbor. You see, you see salvage coming up over and over again as a theme in the Pacific. After the Japanese will attack something, we need to go. We need to go and clear it away. Try to try to repurpose it if it's possible, or even return it to service. As indeed, a lot of the Pearl Harbor fleet ended up being re returned to service, owing in part to because of the, the labors of salvage crews. Clearing Manila Harbor, if you want to, if you want to use Manila Harbor in the, in, in, late in the war in order to attack Japan. You have to you have to create to uh, clear away a lot of stuff that the Japanese have sunk in order to make that harbor impassable and unusable. So again, a mundane function that really pays off in combat terms. Beach beach preparation, CBs. We used to have the, the Narragansett Bay used to be a huge CB place. It, you see you see different uh, different teams of swimmers going out to remove obstacles. Then the CBs bringing up equipment on on land to try to to try to make sandy beaches passable for wheeled or track vehicles such as such as the, such as we needed to use in order to convert these islands into bases to again support the support the fleet operating very forward closer and closer to the adversary. Forward bases I've, I've mentioned several times. You can't you can't expect to to wage war in an adversary's backyard without that sort of logistical support. This is the anchorage at Ulithi. Uh, Ulithia, an atoll in the in the South Atlantic, reportedly able to to uh, accommodate about 700 anchored ships at a time and provide them with that logistical support. Just an just an amazing facility uh, created out of a small atoll in the South Pacific, where you could where you could have things like floating dry docks. I think this is USS Iowa uh, uh, having shaft work done late at, late in the war. But again, if you can do these sorts of logistical, you know logistics and repair things uh, things forward in the theater you don't have to bring those units back and take them off the line for very long you just keep uh, you keep them close to the action and ultimately they can continue pounding the adversary and bringing the end of the war the end of the war a successful end of the war closer and closer to, to consummation and again submarine tenders destroyer tenders things that are in short supply today which i think is which i think is a mistake on our part but again, these are things that are operated in lavish numbers out of the Pacific at places like Ulithi and elsewhere forward in the theater as well. So those are so the, I mean those are some of the, those are some of the the humdrum but also extremely vital uh, cap capabilities without which you simply cannot expect to wage war successfully. And I think and I, and I think revisiting those sort of sort of capabilities as well as all of the, all of the other themes that I've touched on in the last few minutes. I think this I think this actually provides a lot of insight uh, uh, for us. As we try to shape our strategy vis-a-vis -vis the, top, the top contenders we're looking at, which of course are China to a lesser extent, Russia, and then trailing behind North Korea and Iran. And with that, I think I will, I think I will stop and uh, turn it back over to George. And I will I look forward for the most important uh, part of our time together, which is uh, talking among ourselves about these matters. And thank you, Dr. Holmes, a terrific presentation. I really appreciate it. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm sensitive to the time, but we do have about 20 minutes or so for, uh, for questions and answers. And uh, just as a reminder, please uh, remain on mute. Should you have a question to ask, please submit it via the Q&A box, and I will uh, try to get to them as many as I can um, as the, uh, in order that they are received, uh, and, and, we'll try, and I will certainly tee them up for James to respond to. Uh, that said, uh, Dr. Holmes, the first question is from John Fisher. He says, given your big guns background, do you believe we'll ever see a return to Anglico operations using big guns, or has the strategy shifted to over-the-horizon cruise missile platforms? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a sort of a recurring theme. Of, in fact, there's still a faction out there that sort of a bring back the battleships faction. I, and I think at this point, it's, it's, it's way too late. I mean, if they will point out that the, 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 the existing vessels, they don't have a lot of steaming life on them. But you know what? Chronological age actually matters as much as mechanical age. That we, those, are, those were very difficult ships uh, uh, to keep running, even back in my day, which is now 30 years ago. So add 30 years, and it's, it becomes those particular platforms, I think, are, are not going to make a comeback ever. But uh, as far as, as far as guns, as far as guns in general, I think there's I think there is still uh, interest in naval naval gunnery as far as apart even apart from missiles. We obviously we obviously put a lot of 
most of our arsenal is, is anti-ship and anti-air missiles housed in VLS cells on cruisers and destroyers and whatnot. But there, there is, I mean, there is a lingering interest in guns. We, what, unfortunately, I showed you a picture of the Zumwalt, which was going to be our gun platform. It was designed, it was designed as a shore bombardment platform and as a, and as a partial replacement for the Iowa, for the Iowa class. Unfortunately, a few years ago, we, we, these things got they got very very expensive to to the extent that we can only afford three of them. What the, and, and sort of the unintended consequence of that was that the uh, the ammunition, the, the gun, the precision gun ammunition, which was going to be wonderful, and in fact, apparently it worked it worked just fine. But it got so, it got it got so expensive that you were paying eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars or thereabouts for one six inch round, which is not a, which is not a huge round. We, uh, interestingly, uh, on its way on its way to San Diego, the Zumwalt after it was commissioned, I think in nineteen, or I think, no, not nineteen, but 20, 2016, I think it was perhaps twenty fifteen, stopped at Newport to, to, and gave tours. I happened to draw the gunnery officer from the Zumwalt uh, for uh, uh, for my tour, and he was, he was talking about, hey, you know, we can we can we're so high tech that we can arrange for fifteen of these rounds to arrive at the same place at the same time to create that huge bang that you associate with the battleships. Well. You multiply 15 by 850,000, and th that in that indicates the scale of the problem. And with the with the result that the Zumwalt's guns have been uh, more or less inactivated, and it it appears that uh, that sort of that sort of uh, that that sort of gunnery option is not a, is not really an option right now. We're talking about uh, we're talking about uh, replacing those gun mounts with uh, hypersonic silos or, or whatever the case may be. There are a few things going in the gunnery realm, though. There's there are uh, uh, high velocity project projectiles that you can actually fire out of uh, existing five inch guns. On cruisers and destroyers, so I think so. I think that's probably going to be the best substitute that we have right now. But uh, yeah, it makes makes me sad not to see, not to see that happen. But uh, it, I think it's just not in the cards right now. But look down, look down the road, and then and we'll see what happens. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, just as a thank you for that, and, and as a follow up, I guess, and and and, and frankly, I'm, I'm not familiar with it. But uh, John says, is there any? Do you have any interesting intel on the WIS KYBB merger of hulls? I know. So was that a Wisconsin question? Okay, you kind of you kind of got uh, interrupted there a little bit at the end. Yeah, I, I'm. Uh, so any interesting intel on the WIS dash KYBB merger of hulls? Oh, I guess that's a, that was a little before my time. That was back in the 1950s when the uh, yeah the Wisconsin actually. I think it was the destroyer Eden. It was always a, a, a Wisconsin in, in fog off Norfolk collided with with a tin can. Basically, basically uh, knocked a huge gash in the bow. USS was, uh, Kentucky was not going to be finished, so they just they just took the they just took the bow off of that and and actually and actually and actually uh, grafted it right on there. To the extent that one of our standard talking points when we would give talk, uh, tours of the ship was we were the biggest battleship because we were three inches longer because of because of merging the, the Kentucky's bow on there. So yeah, this the, that was kind of an interesting point about the Pacific War is that there was a lot of construction going on in the expectation of the war going on longer and a lot of it got canceled and, and, and ultimately right. got shut down towards the end including another right. I, I apologize i apologize for not catching the to, to the agreement i do recall that that, that yeah, topic yeah. Uh, now so I, I wasn't sure if we were talking about something uh more modern uh and how it be, that might be a, applicable today uh no, so a question from, from, a question from mike turner in world war ii we basically went it alone in the pacific maritime aor with some contributions from the uk Royal Navy and the Royal Air Force. Do you, um, sorry, Royal Australian Navy. Do you see that the uh, that equation changing much in today's environment, particularly in the uh, Japanese maritime self defense force? Yeah, this is a this is a. I mean, I painted a pretty dark picture as I usually do, just because looking at looking at it, the at the strategic uh, correlation of forces, it, a lot of it does look pretty daunting. But I, I actually think we're in a better we're in a better place now than we were in the 1940s on the alliance front. I mean, I look at the geography that I, I pointed out that the first island chain belongs to us, it belongs to ourselves and our allies and our friends. I mean, the, the first island chain is ours to lose. And we have a lot of we have a lot of uh, uh, options as far as as far as mounting that offshore blockade using using uh, geography in concert with military power. But as far as the so having having that alliance with Japan is absolute. It's not only invaluable, it's essential. We have no strategic position in the Western Pacific without our allies, whether it's Japan, South Korea, the Philippine, the Philippine Islands, 
pick, pick your favorite ally. So, so in that sense, we're in a much. We don't. We don't have to necessarily fight our way all the way across the Pacific. We can try to stand in, as, as General Berger, the, the Marine Corps Commandant, talks about, and defy and defy China to try to drive drive us out of the region at the outset of a conflict. And so that's point one. That's point one. As far as bringing the European allies and and the role and the Australians into it, here's a, just a, just one quick marker that's about to happen right now. The uh, the Royal Navy has just uh, developed its first supercarrier, Queen Elizabeth. That ship, is, that ship is about to deploy for the first time, and its its air wing is going to be, or at least its fixed wing air wing is going to be made up primarily of U.S. Marine Corps F-35 stealth stealth fighters. 10, 10 out of fifteen, 10 out of, ten out of fifteen planes on board that ship are going to be American. That's a, and that's really a, if you think about it, that's really a strong signal to your adversary. If you're actually mingling crews as well as hardware into single fighting forces, that suggests that our alliances will not be broken by what China might do to us, uh, do to us in time of war. That signals that the UK would be all in, all in on the conflict as well. The, the more we can, the more we can, come to, we can come to what uh, CNO Gil Day calls interchangeability, interchangeability among U.S. U.S. and allied military units. Again, not only does that provide fighting power, but that also signals that we all have skin in the game of our common cause in the Western Pacific. So, the more we the more we can merge into a democratic armada with the Japanese, with the British, the French, whoever whoever the case may be, the better off we all are because that announces that we will not be divided against ourselves in times of war. Right, right. Yeah, I, I understand. Uh, from John Rogard, uh, why are you assuming it would be a short war? I'm assuming it's a short war because that's a, well, primarily because that's what the adversary wants to make it. I mean, if you, if, I mean, look, pick your pick your favorite scenario. How long does it take the PLA to go across the Taiwan Strait and conquer Taiwan? Does it take four years? If, if the answer is yes, then I think we can we can afford to 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 bank on a, a repeat of the Pacific War and and hope that we can have a satisfactory outcome. But given that we know that Taiwan only lays about lays about 90 miles off the, off the Chinese coast and that China has stationed an imposing array of not only of naval, naval but also military and, and air force hardware across the street from it wow i mean that's a so that's a i mean that, that's really your standard right there Senkaku islands one of the big sticking points between china and japan how long does it take to to conquer these unoccupied uh, islands and, and seize them from japan to, probably, again, probably, it probably is not measured in years. It's probably measured in uh, weeks or months. So, this is a, this is one reason that the the Navy and the Marines have talked so much about stand-in forces, forces that will not be driven out of the out of the region and will continue to make things tough on our adversary. To try to, to try in, well, primarily because of, of a deterrent, primarily, primarily as a deterrent, but also to show that to show China that we will be there when the when the chips are down and we will not be driven out and have to fight our way back in the way the way we did. During the Second World War, so when you see the when you see these uh, these sort of cutesy phrases flying around, that's that's kind of what the message we're trying to send to Beijing. Yeah, no, I understand. Uh, next question is from Victor Sussman. It seems unlikely China will permit uncontested logistics in a future conflict. What can the Pacific War teach the U.S. Navy to mitigate the risks of area denial weapons to supporting dispersed units in distributed maritime operations? Yeah, you could you couldn't be more right, and I, in fact, I I don't know if I said it outright, but I certainly alluded to it. The the Japanese did not. In a, there was something there's something embedded, I think, in Japanese strategic culture that that did not at that time see uh, attacking a freighter or whatnot as being you know it wasn't uh, it wasn't something that was important. It really didn't resonate with the Japanese leadership. Uh, it was it was seen as a, it was unwarrior like. I mean, it would, there was no there was no glory in it or honor in it. And I think, and I think the Chinese have learned from that that logistic, logistics is extremely important. And you you could not be more. In fact, you, if you if you put me in charge of the PLA, heaven forbid, I, I, the first thing I would do as, as part of Chinese maritime strategy, I would order, I would order missile and air forces and and the, and the navy to take out the U.S. combat logistics fleet, uh, as well as any merchant marine uh, units that are brought in to, to, to support our battle fleet because. Take those things away. The battlefield is going to wither on the vine, or at least it will go away eventually. So, I think that, I think that is certainly a, a lesson that China's PLA has learned learned from the Pacific War. They've also learned, and, and it's not just the Pacific War. China. One thing you have to know about the Chinese is that there are a lot of them in think tanks and places like that, and they do their homework. They study not only the Pacific War but also things like the the, the Falklands War of 1982. I mean, look at look at look at the the, the potential resemblance between that and a Taiwan scenario. 
you have a Western power sending a fleet across thousands of miles of ocean against a, against a home power that can, can, do th can do things to try to make things on that expeditionary force. The Argentines obviously did not get it done, but China's not Argentina, and, 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 China, and China thinks that it can improve drastically on, on that sort of home team performance and, and really accomplish its goals on, on Taiwan or, the, or whatever the offshore uh, battleground happens to be. So, but yeah, it's really, it, that, is that is certainly something to worry about. And if, we are very lean. We are very lean on the logistics side, as, as I intimated. Yeah, yeah. No, obviously an, an interesting topic and in, in, in generating a lot of a lot of questions here tonight. So uh, we'll try to get get through as many as we can. From Ben Jarrett, uh, one of the hallmarks of the Japanese effort in World War II was the lack of unified command over the Army and Navy, and the resource challenges that posed. How does Chinese command structure compare? Are they a joint force? Uh, the answer is increasingly yes. They were, you, and, and you're right to call it to attention to this. It, this has one of been one of the things. It's it's sort of been in the making for for quite some time, but especially when President Xi Jinping came out in late in late 19. Or, I, can't, I keep wanting to go back to the 20th century in late 2012. The, uh, the one of one of his big things has been not only to I mean he's doing anti-corruption stuff throughout the government and the military, but he's he's also he's also also instructed the military to reorganize reorganize itself as a joint force. Which is one reason you'll hear weird things like the PLA Army. I mean, it used to all be the PLA. The PLA was the Army, and the Navy and the Air Force were sort of were sort of adjuncts to that Army. But now you're actually see, you're actually seeing the Navy, the, the Navy and the PLA Air Force is more or less co-equal with the Army, which which testifies to that sort of joint ethos that uh, she and the top the top the top brass in the PLA are trying to put it, trying to put into place. And I think that and I actually think that that makes uh, China even a more, even a more formidable foe for, for for reasons that you you point out. I mean, the army. The, what, I think the the, the the midway movie from a couple of years ago didn't get didn't get wonderful ratings. But one thing that it did a wonderful job of showing is that the Imperial Japanese Army and the Imperial Japanese Navy saw each other as as, as enemies in a sense. The, the army was the senior service. The navy wanted to be the senior service. There was no real, no one really to referee between them. No no powerful central decision maker among the politicians. And essentially, that that really that, that really uh, disfit disfigured the Japanese war effort to the extent where by the by the, by the end of the war effort uh, in 1945, you got 1.8 million Japanese still fighting in China, and you have all this fighting going out of the Pacific, and that's because they're looking along different vectors as to where the war ought to be. So, you know, yeah. I think, I think so, kind of set out to avoid that. Yeah. So, so another another kind of piece which is interesting, you know, with the fragility of our networks and, of course, the cyber threat and artificial intelligence. I mean, and and, and, and I know that it, it, you hear it being discussed uh, tangentially a little bit. Is is could we even afford a war anymore? Is a is a force on force war actually even a realistic course of action? So Mitch Mitch Henderson writes a writes a question: Can we actually afford to wage warfare anymore? Can you talk to cost? <clears throat> excuse me. Can you cost? Uh, can you talk to cost effectiveness today a bit? Yeah, I think that's a, you don't usually hear it framed in those terms, but I think I think it's a great I think it's a great way of looking at. It. And you actually do hear this sort of this sort of uh, this sort of discussion again, not 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 phrased exactly thus, but you do hear that this concern with cost. I mean, think about it, when, when was the last time the United States Navy brought in? A new weapons platform on time and on budget. It's been a while. I mean, you, you, could, you could go back to the turn of the century and look at the. You can look at the Ford aircraft carrier, which is still having growing pains. Its its costs have gone up. The literal combat ships, uh, the literal combat ships have have, have still ha are still having growing pains. Twelve years after we we commissioned the first of them, it looks like we might actually even lose a class because of an engineering defect. I mean, there's a, there's there's a lot there's a lot of issues. Even aside from cost, if we were getting if we were getting working platforms for what we're putting into, that might be one thing. But the fact is, the fact is that we're having a hard time getting efficient efficiency and effectiveness out of the shipbuilding and weapons or the defense industrial the, the defense industrial base. Partly, partly, I would lay that upon the upon the manufacturers. Partly, it's on it's on the, it's on the navy constantly changing the requirements that they put into these or that they impose on these programs. But yeah, so there so cost is a problem, efficiency is a problem, all of these things are a problem. But even so, I think I think your question is extremely well placed. Can you actually? I mean, is it, is it just baked into the system that every generation is going to cost a lot more than the last? I know. I think that's I think that's something worth asking. If you look at the price, say, of an SM6 missile or something, you know, one of our one even one of our munitions. I mean, these are these things cost millions of dollars a piece. That makes for a pretty expensive engagement. 
Now, if you can take if you can take out a, a very expensive enemy warship with a six million dollar missile or a four or whatever the case may be, that becomes a pretty good exchange ratio. But the, but the fact is that we have to we do have to contend with this. Well, at one point, one more, just one more point off the topic. That's or that's not off the topic. It's off the historical topic. The in the late Cold War, in the late Cold War, Andy Marshall, the founding director of the of the Pentagon's Office of Net Assessment, came up with an idea he called competitive strategies. And I think it goes to your point. The idea that was that the Soviets in the late Cold War had figured out how to invest in things that were cheap for them and very, very expensive for the United States to defend against. And, and Marshall and Marshall called, Marshall called for looking for ways to flip the cost curve on the Soviets uh, using submarines, using, using things that we were really good at and we could afford in order to impose heavy costs on the Soviets and, and wear away at their economy, but basically made it, make it so that they could not afford to wage war. And this, this I think, uh, figured into the end game of the Cold War with Gorbachev and his advisors. So, yeah, figuring out who can figuring out who can afford more 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 affordably is a, is, a, is certainly key to strategy and ultimately to who gets their way in a in a fight. Uh, yeah, I understand. E excellent points. So we have just about five minutes left. So probably have time for one more question and maybe some closing remarks uh, from Shelley Garrett. Uh, what is the status of our merchant marine, a key element in the Pacific War, in the event of conflict in the Pacific with China? Yeah, I worry about it. I mean, it's a, I, I hope I conveyed that. So that's that's that really, it's it's a little bit squarely because the the, the different ships that that are owned by the United States government that could go into that could go into carrying material and manpower to to the theater of combat. But it, 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 I, I, I did my best to track it down a, a couple of years ago, and it appears that we have a, somewhere between two hundred and three hundred ships, which sounds like a lot. Except that if you go back to the Second World War and look in the Atlantic, and if you look at what what the U-boats did in the in 1942 into into 1943, they actually sank or destroyed. They actually sank or crippled more ships than that, trying to get across to, to, to the Atlantic to Great Britain and ultimately uh, for the invasion of Normandy and all these things that we did in the Atlantic theater. So it's it's, it's it, I mean if we have fewer ships on the whole than we lost in a single year of combat. That suggests, that suggests that we have a, re a real problem on our hands, especially since the Pacific's a whole lot bigger. We know that China has all these anti-access munitions that I spent some time talking about. Yeah, it's a real problem. And, I, and I, the, the good news is, the, the good news is, and I'll, I'll close with a sort of an upbeat note, the sea service leadership and the military leadership, we know we have a problem. And if we know we have a problem, I think that, I think that we're, we stand a much better chance of, of, of starting, to, starting to get right it's starting to come up with ways to to work around these problems, whether it's by uh, buying more and lighter warships, whether it's uh, about figuring out other ways to perhaps buy second second hand cargo ships to try to aug augment our numbers and, and help us get around these things. So, uh, in, in, in that sense, I th in that that sense, I think that I feel pretty good. I feel pretty good because it does feel, feel like we are taking this seriously. We have decided to compete, and I have to hope that if we decide to compete, we're going to do okay. <laughs> No, uh, I understand. Uh, so, th so thank you, Dr. Holmes. It was truly an honor to host you this evening to speak about a very interesting and rele relevant topic, and we appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to spend it with us this evening. I'm sorry we couldn't get to the rest of the questions, but uh, I do like to, to finish on time, and I know people might even have another presentation tonight that they would like to take advantage of. Obviously, there's a lot of competition in this virtual space, and there's a lot of terrific information that's being shared out there, So, uh, so thank you. Uh, and we look forward to getting you back again soon, um, uh, perhaps for another presentation uh, later in the year. Thanks, George. Yeah, it was, it was a pleasure to be with all of you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes tonight's presentation. Thank you again for joining us. And, and please join us on March 31st for a presentation by Dr. James Krasker, who will speak to guests about disruptive technologies in international law. Updates on this topic and others are posted on the Foundation's website, at nwcfoundation.org, and be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube. And finally, the Naval War College Foundation and the James E. Hayes Chicago Endowment will host a virtual Sentinel of the Sea Award presentation on Wednesday, March 24th, to honor Medal of Honor recipient First Sergeant Alan J. Lynch, United States Army retired. The Sentinel of the Sea Award is the highest award presented by the Naval War College Foundation to recognize American citizens representing the traditions and values of the U.S. Naval War College. It is an honor to further recognize First Sergeant Lynch's selflessness and courage in defense of our nation with the Sentinel of the Sea Award. We invite you to join us in honoring First Sergeant Lynch as we salute and thank him for his service by registering for this event 
at nwcfoundation.org forward slash SOS Lynch. Again, that's nwcfoundation.org forward slash SOS for Sentinel of the Sea Lynch. For additional information, you can also contact Shauna McGowan uh, at shauna.mcgowan at nwcfoundation.org. That's S H A W N A dot M C G E O W N at nwcfoundation.org or simply give her a call at 401 848 8308. Thank you very much. Have a great rest of your evening. Stay well, and we'll see you soon.